welcome everybody back for another episode of Making Monsters. Uh, today we are talking Vikings and bears again. I know it's just a few weeks ago that we were doing that, but it is time again for some reason. The NFL scheduled every divisional opponent for the Bears at week 11 and on. So it's been an interesting kind of road to see that happen. And right when things have just hit the fan uh, completely. But anyways, I'm joined by Luke Braun today. Luke Braun, NFL. You'll find him on Twitter. Uh, he covers the Vikings for Locked On Vikings. So Luke, thank you so much for helping out with me. Yeah, of course. No problem. I know we joked a little bit because originally we were finding a time and I was like Thursday at eight and you're like, okay, that's right during football, yeah. Thursday night football. I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm I don't sorry. about you. I have to watch uh, a potential game clinch, uh, playoff clinching game here. Yes, I don't know like, when yours not, is going to come, but mine could out. be now. We're talking draft now, Luke. So. <laughs> <laughs> Tankathon up. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, so let's, let's get on to some of the stuff that happened in this previous game because as – we just played three weeks. There's not going to be a ton of changes in what's going on roster wise. Um, but just to get your insight on what you saw in that game, it was an overtime game. Vikings ended up winning uh, by a field goal in overtime. Both quarterbacks looked good. Both had 330, 340 yards, multiple touchdowns. But let's start a little bit with the Vikings side. Uh, Sam Darnold in that game, 330 yards. Jordan Addison was the the shining, the bright shining moment in that game, though. And I know a lot of people love Justin Jefferson, but that is the scary part about having a Jordan Addison and a Justin Jefferson. Because if you want to focus your attention on Justin Jefferson, then Jordan Addison has all the capability of going off himself. And that's kind of what happened in this game, in addition to TJ Hawkinson really becoming being used a little bit more, which the Bears have struggled with tight ends a lot anyways. But tell us a little bit about that. How do teams handle both of those both of those weapons and what could you see maybe changing this weekend if the bears could try and fix anything yeah so everybody's got their own plan right some people want to try to bracket and zone everything off and try to double and some people think that you know they've got a guy they think they trust and some good times um you know like everybody's got their own way to like structure this and the, the bears had one of the most fascinating plans and i don't think you can say it worked yeah uh because you know you had Jordan Addison over 100, TJ Hawkinson over 100, and he gave up over 100 from scrimmage to the running back too. Yep. So I don't know if the Bears do the same thing. I'll actually be fascinated. No more Eberflus, different group of, you know, different brain trust. Do they come up with the same idea? But so the Bears are a cover three team, right? They yep. they love to, you know, middle of the field closed, zone it off, uh, zone matchy matchy, right? But they locked the side with Justin Jefferson. And what that means is Jalen Johnson was over there. He shadowed. Uh -huh. So it's like having one man coverage guy in what is otherwise his own structure. So let's say Jalen Johnson was a deep third player. If Justin Jefferson's running a crosser, your deep third player is now running with that crosser. And one yeah. of your zone play, one of the other players now needs to come over and become that deep third player. They didn't communicate that well at all. Yeah. And it gave up a whole bunch of big, giant, wide open ones. You might remember like a big, wide open. How did TJ Hawkinson get that open? Well, because there's nobody in that zone. Yeah, because somebody was supposed to replace and they didn't know who was supposed to replace it. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's interesting because it it then gave Jalen Johnson the freedom to press with impunity, to have help to the inside, help to the to the deep, help to outside, like to help everywhere, no yeah. matter where Justin Jefferson was. He could play it to wherever he knew the rest of those zone coverages were, but then play man coverage really aggressively there. So it worked on Justin Jefferson. But like at what cost? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that so I I don't know if they do it again, but yeah. that's a fascinating little side story to this one. Yeah, and it, it's funny because the last time I was previewing this matchup, we had that conversation of how the Bears address this. Do you put Jalen on Justin and kind of let everybody? And pretty much what they do is that first guess of what could happen. But then we were like, okay, what other ways could you address this? And that other ways you address that is maybe put two guys on Justin Jefferson, double him and let Jalen cover whoever else, because Jalen's your best corner and have him kind of do all of the work against the other guys. And so it, it, it will be interesting to see how they adjust this weekend because the, the run game has been an issue. That was something I had already talked about. The run defense has been really bad. The pass defense has been something, one of your strong suits. And so it that was kind of disappointing to see two guys go over 100 plus Aaron Jones, who's done it to us many times when even when he was in Green Bay. And so yeah, it, I I, I, <laughs> yeah, I am fascinated to see how much they change. To your point, Iberflu's gone, Eric Washington, what he does. They were not able to 
cover George Kittle to save their lives last week. So I'm terrified to see how they managed to do that with TJ Hawkinson and then now trying to choose between Jordan Addison and Justin Jefferson. But in in your mind, though, when you look at this, yes, it's hard to do. Those are two very hard wide receivers to kind of figure out. But defensively, they did. They, I think, ended up having nine QB hits and three sacks on Sam Darnold. Mm -hmm. um, so they were able to create some pressure and things like that. What were your thoughts overall of how the defense were able to kind of contain certain aspects of what has been a really explosive Vikings offense all year? Yeah, so like for reasons I just said, I, I think the plan was not right. I get okay. what they were going for, but that was not ultimately a, a good idea. And maybe the Bears will disagree and they'll say, well, you know, if we execute it right, it all works on the whiteboard and we're going to try again and do the same thing and see if we can't get it together this time. Um, but I think player to player, matchup to matchup, the Bears did well. You know, Jalen Johnson did a good job on the best receiver in the league. Um, guys like Karan Dexter, guys like Montez Sweat, like they had reasonable games when they could get those one-on-ones. And the thing about the Vikings is they hold the ball so long. Sam yeah. Darnold likes to hold the ball for a long time and, and survey and sit there. But it also is just that, that I mean, they're running 20 yard routes that he's sitting and waiting to see, you know, how that yeah. develops. Develop, yeah. So it, it, it takes forever. Um, and that means you got you're, you're a sitting duck back there. So there's going to be a lot of scrambling and there's going to be a lot of running around and, and trying to buy time, which, you know, you guys are familiar with, with, with Caleb Williams. Yeah. So, it, you know, Darnold's doing the same thing. He's just mm -hmm. doing it more responsibly, I guess, yeah. than the rookie. Like, doing it like a veteran does it, not like yeah. a rookie does it. Uh, but, that, but like, I, I would absolutely expect plenty of pressure. They're giving up four or five sacks a game. I have no reason to expect anything different. Is that a lot of it because of Darisaw being out and Cam Robinson not being able to play to that level? Or is it other things no. happening? Okay. No, he's, he's Cam Robinson is like not the problem. He's been doing great. It's the okay. interior. The interior has been the problem all year. Okay. So in the game, I think it was the game right before the Chicago game. Mm -hmm. uh, they made a switch at right guard from Ed Ingram to Dalton Reisner, hoping for better pass protection. They haven't really gotten it. And the communication, I think, now that you've kind of had to swap two guys out over the course of a month yeah, um, with Cam Robinson replacing Darisaw, and then you've swapped the right guard now too. So the communication has broken down a lot. They busted a lot of protections. They just, they just kind of can't stop messing up and either leaving somebody in a one-on-one -on -one that you would have rather prevented or, you know, just Brad Garrett Bradbury, the center, passes a guy off to the left guard. The left guard doesn't pick him up. Free run to the quarterback. It's just like busting a coverage. Yeah. Uh, and that has happened a ton. So they've been kind of discombobulated up front. And the thing about it is the Vikings, like Kevin O'Connell, bless his heart, has so much confidence in his players mm -hmm. that he is not going to start adapting the play calling to, to paper over this issue. He is going to look at his O-line coach and his O-line players and say, you guys can fix this, right? Because I'm going to keep calling big, long shot plays yeah. and it's on you guys to fix it. Um, I, I think he has that adaptation if he needs it, but he really doesn't want to push that button. Yeah, and I think, believe me, we know the offensive line struggle storyline. It's huh. been, I, it's been the interior for us too. I think I, I personally, Darnell Wright has been a really, really good tackle, and I think in year two, you're seeing he's the tackle of the right tackle of the future. Braxton Jones, a lot of people have questions on, but that's not my biggest question mark. My biggest question mark is similar to you guys. It's the entire interior, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I love Tevin Jenkins, but Tevin Jenkins gets hurt constantly, and so it's kind of hard to rely on that because. Every other game he's having to leave and someone else is having to come in and play left guard. And then now you're in this a new formation What's, uh, once again. Nate Davis, who was supposed to be the starting right guard, was awful, never showed up, never practiced. And then they had to kind of replace that last minute. The the center, Coleman Shelton, is all right. Like, he's okay. You can get by with him, but he gets shoved back into Caleb Williams a ton. And so there's issues there. And, and I think that now you are talking about the seventh different offensive line formation in front of Caleb Williams and you're you're it's showing he's been sacked almost 60 times this season and so that's just not feasible for a quarterback in general let alone a rookie quarterback and well and he but, likes to hold it too yes. for his own reasons because he's trying to run around and scramble and stuff Two but things. he can't quite run away from these guys like he did back at yeah. uh, at USC at USC and that was one of the things when we were drafting him I was having that conversation with a lot of people like they would say that about Justin Fields Justin Fields holds the ball mm -hmm. too long I'm like Caleb Williams does the same exact thing he his time to throw in college was like 3.4 seconds or something like that because he likes to yeah. make those big hero well, plays balloon the average because you run around for 10 seconds once yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
I will say he's done well when it comes to those moments when they do speed things up and they, they go quick tempo, no huddle, just get this ball out. Caleb plays. He is really good in those moments. I would like to see more of that, especially because the line's so bad, but talk a little bit about what you saw in that game from Caleb Williams. Obviously he had 340 yards, a couple touchdowns too. There's, there's misses. There's some throws where you're like, man, that's incredible. If you can just make that consistent, he's now on a stretch where he hasn't thrown an interception and a, a lot of passes. I can't remember how much he fumbled last week, but hasn't thrown a pick in a while. So he's been really secure with the ball, which is nice because that was one problem Justin Fields had was turn over, turning the ball over, whether it was fumbles or interceptions, but a little bit about that game. It was a DJ Moore and Keenan Allen game pretty much is what that turned into. So thoughts mm -hmm. on the offense, thoughts on Caleb. Oh, you're asking a hater. You're, you're yeah. asking the wrong guy. Okay. So here's the thing. I, I think Caleb Williams is, is a victim of expectations that maybe is not his fault, right? Like, I, I think that he he came in and he was supposed to be the golden boy right away. And, you know, we, we heard so much about how how the Bears were the, the best place for a rookie quarterback and uh, that they were going to immediately come in. They were a dark horse Super Bowl contender, first rookie ever to win the Super Bowl. Like, the expectations were on the roof. Yeah. And then it turned out he was a rookie that needed to have some rookie growing moments, right? Yeah. And everybody's now trying to excuse away their old optimism. But, well, it's the O-line's fault. Well, it's the coach's fault. Well, it's like, no, this, it, he messes up. I mean, he, he on on the, the the last couple of drives, which turned into successful drives, but like, yeah. man, he airmailed a couple of those to Romo Dunze. Yeah. That sack at the end of overtime, that's a horrific play. Yeah. I mean, that's a terrible play. That's a get you benched play if you're not the one overall pick in your rookie year, right? Like if you're just a, if you're in any kind of QB competition, that sack gets you ousted. Yeah. It's just horrible. And so for me, Caleb has been, you know, five to 10 really great plays, five to 10 truly just dreadful, horrible, awful plays. And then the stuff in the middle, which I think is a better way to evaluate a guy, right? Take the tails of the bell curve off. Yeah, and yeah. What's, what's the meat of your thing? And it's blase. It's, you know, a little speed out here. It's stick. It's. You know, there's a lot of change of the play at the line of scrimmage, and that doesn't always work. And I like that he has the freedom to do it. I like that he has the confidence to do it. But, dude, mm -hmm. you got to be right. Yeah. Uh, and all of, like, a lot of that stuff comes with time. Yeah. But lo and behold, a rookie needs time. Yeah. So I, I am not, like, willing to give as much grace because I was told I wasn't going to have to. Yeah. Uh, and, and it makes me like a hater, but like, yeah, I mean like, like that, the big long one down the field to Deandre Swift, the, the play that set up the tying field goal, um, was all that stuff was really awesome. And, and here yeah. is a thing about the Vikings that I'm worried about going into this one is so much of that offensive production came in two minute yeah. field goal drive at the end of the half. And then the touchdown drive and then another field goal drive 27 points, 13 of it came in two minute. Yeah. So what? like help <laughs> like that's that uh, there's going to be two minute again yeah. and the vikings have been totally melting down in two minute but it it when you're in your down to down when it's second and six right first and ten your neutral situations the vikings were dominant dominant yeah. but then once you got to two minute they softened up a little bit the coverages they were calling the eight man coverages that didn't put any pressure caleb could sit back there forever and just find something and then it's just picking apart a zone well he knows how to do that yeah so the Vikings are going to have to change something about the way they approach their two minute defense. Yeah. Um, they, they did have success in a two minute situation crucial against Arizona. So they saw that they did that, but then they gave up a field goal at the end of the half again, like it just no resistance at all. Marched yeah. right down, easy kick, go into the half up three points more. They, they're going to have to fix that. And that might be the best opportunity. The, the faster the bears can go. Yeah. Especially in neutral situations, yes. the faster they can get to the ball and get the play off, the more it takes away some of the confusing things that Brian Flores can do, yeah. the, the clearer the picture is going to be, but your operation has to be stable for that. And yeah. you need stable coaching. You need a stable sideline operation. And Bears are still figuring out who they want to be doing what. So yeah. I don't know if that's going to work. Well, and that's part of it. Like going back to that, there were high expectations. There's high expectations for any quarterback drafted, number one. I went back and I tweeted today actually of the – last like five, six quarterbacks drafted one over uh, first overall. And all of them who had insane records in college and maybe lost two or three times had losing records when they came to the NFL their first year. That's just kind of part of what it is. It's part of it, yeah. To your point, the Bears were like, okay, they get Keenan Allen. You have DJ Moore. You drafted Roma Dunze. You did all of these things to help him. I think the 
little asterisk that should have been put on that is you had a head coach who most people already wanted fired last year. And so, yeah, they felt like, did it again, man. I, I know <laughs> as, as much as I think you had everything on the field, people felt was the right thing. I think there was a lot of cautious optimism for me and for a lot of people that I'm around because they didn't have the trust in Matt Eberflus. You don't know what Shane Waldron was. You heard awful things from Jackson Smith and Jigba and about him and about how he runs the offenses. So there was a lot of question marks, but I think people thought because there was so many weapons that it was going to be it was going to be at least a little easier for him. Um, but I will say also the leading rusher in that game was Caleb Williams with 33 yards. If you can't get the ball going on the ground, then that does also hinder your offense in a lot of ways too. And unfortunately that's been it. Like DeAndre Swift is kind of this boomer bust kind of running back. He either you feel like he's getting 15 yards or negative five yards and there's no in between with him. And so that's kind of been an issue this year too. Roshan Johnson's been beat up the last couple of weeks. So you haven't even had that other option to have him out there. But I do think that we've seen progress throughout the year of just of Justin Fields. I'm still like in this world of Caleb Williams. And I they're think not that, that similar, right? Yeah. yeah. I um I just spent so many months talking about Justin Fields, even yeah. through like April that I'm like, OK, um, but I've personally seen the progress and I was very critical when it was time. I was more of a keep Justin, build around Justin, trade for the hall type of person. Um, the more I've got to know Caleb and the more I've seen Caleb, I honestly have been like, okay, they made the right choice, but it, it took me a little bit and I'm still figuring, I'm still kind of figuring out what this offense looks like with him because he, he does some like crazy explosive things, but he does sail passes sometimes. And like, I, I think that's you, he's a rookie. And I think that to your point, people thought he was already going to be here and that just wasn't a realistic expectation. But he's also on his third offensive coordinator this year. Now a, back, a new defensive play caller. Now we have a new head coach and the line he's 56 times he's been sacked. And we have somebody for our uh, for Wendy City Gridiron that tracks the sacks and kind of notches like who what sacks on what N oh. nine of them have been tallied to him. So it's still 48 sacks that are out of his control this season. So that does play a factor in what he's able to do the time that you can develop certain things. And Shin Waldron was weird. Luke, like Shane Waldron had Keenan Allen, his yeah, average. Like, his like average, what was he doing, man? I don't know. His he had Keenan Allen. His average depth of target was like eleven point five. When in his whole career, his average depth of target was seven point five. He's just that like crisp route runner that you want to do in like those like short intermediate. And for some reason, he had him running down the field 15, 20 yards. And I was like, what are we doing? Like I don't understand. <laughs> That, that was bizarre. I, I'll give you so the the pre draft before I knew he was a bear, right? And then I, and then you know everybody can cry bias, but pre draft when I was watching down all the quarterbacks to see who the Vikings were going to take, we took one too. Mm -hmm. uh, and my thing on Caleb was like this scramble drill is heavily overrated. There's some really really eye popping highlights that he gets on them that won't translate to the NFL, right? Yeah. I mean it, like that that throw to DeAndre Swift. How often do you see that? That yeah. is not an every play kind of thing. You get that maybe once a day, but probably not that often. Yeah, and the the scramble drill is overrated because he does a lot of this of, of he has a lot of habit, habits that college players can't punish you for but like he goes backwards you yes. don't want to yeah. go you got to flatten out keep your depth yes um he's good at throwing on the run i would love to get him in rollouts for but sure. when he when it's time to scramble he doesn't protect the football he doesn't play it's as nearly as safe as he should be uh a lot of times he gets caught with one hand on the ball that's a big no-no and he goes backwards and he and he he's imprecise with that stuff and he's just sort of schoolyarding it. It's like there, there needs to be an art to this. And so my thought was like, wherever he goes, and then it pretty clearly became uh, the Chicago. case that it was going to yeah. be Chicago when they traded Justin Fields. It's like, okay, Chicago, your job is to rein that scramble drill in yep. and turn him into a regular quarterback, which he can do. He's got the mechanics to do that. He's got the talent, the flexibility to just be normal. But yeah. you got to kind of whip that out of him. And... I think they have. I think they have sort of restrained that and made it so that that's not as much of uh, like the His first game. Yeah, it was a it was a crutch, right? Yeah. Um, but the like as the season went on, he's now just like drop back timing, rhythm throw. Get used to that. And I think once he gets comfortable with that, then the physical talents will start to shine. 
but that will take time and it's going to take a level of patience. And then the question becomes how patient is this organization and how patient is Ryan Poles who suddenly feels his butt getting, getting a little warm. <laughs> yeah. And who the next person is coaching this team. That's a big question right. too. And I, I will tell you, cause I do want to talk a little bit more about the Vikings defense, but I, I work with somebody here in Jacksonville cause Caleb trained here in the off season. Mm -hmm. And I worked with someone here in Jacksonville who, told me that he was like, you, I can't really tell you everything because they have signed documents where he can't go in and tell me all the details of conversations he has with Caleb Williams. But he was like, that place was a disaster. Like you do not understand how bad it was with Shane Waldron, like to the point where yeah. I guess Caleb had to call and ask for if he could hire someone to go over film with him because Shane Waldron and the bears were not going over film with him. Like it was a mess. And to, he built a film room in his house reportedly to do it, like get extra and was going to hire a person to come like go over this film because they weren't putting in the work with him. It was a mess. like, and this is, so that was just like the, the beginning. And this is what, this is why there were the rumors this off season that they, his camp didn't want him coming to Chicago. I heard that's not true, but I understand if a quarterback wouldn't want to come here because we just ruined everybody <laughs> in Chicago. It's like so sad, but um, let's move on to the defense a little bit because I, I don't want to keep you too long and we're already over 20. But the Vikings defense, uh, when we they played last week, also three sacks on Caleb, two from mm -hmm. Jonathan Grenard at that time, Van Ginkle, who has really, I, I feel like Van Ginkle's season has been really fun to watch this season. Um, and then Pat Jones was in there. Pat Jones is a guy, too, that I think like has surprised some people with how he's getting to the quarterback. Uh, seven sacks, I think, on the season. So. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that pass rush and uh, what to expect again this weekend, because I'm sure they're, they're going to be getting to Caleb. Yeah, the whole philosophy is, you know, you don't know who's coming, who isn't. And they love to use flattened out fronts, you know, five man surfaces, you know, tight fronts or just like regular three. They love to put a lot of guys on the line of scrimmage. That means you don't get to double anybody. Everybody's got to be one on one and win a matchup. Yeah. And, you know, for Braxton Jones versus Jonathan Grenard, you got to win your matchup because of the, the structure. You don't get any help. Good luck. That's worked on a lot of teams. Yeah. Um, the, the big sack that Grenard got at the end, he was on a tight end and a running back. And it just took, you know, took him forever, but <laughs> he kind of held the ball forever, but he got <laughs> there, right? Uh, and so however you set up that protection, it's it's meant to make chaos, but then obviously there's all kinds of blitzes. The Vikings used their cover zero look, which is the one where everybody's on the line of scrimmage, except for, you know, a couple of people in off-man coverage, mm -hmm. the most of any game against the Bears. That's throwing everything at a rookie, right? That's saying, okay, yeah. read this, dude. Yeah, yeah, you're still trying to figure out how to get your like cadences right. Okay, read this. Yeah. And I would be surprised if we didn't see about the same thing on Monday night. Yeah, I will. I know last year the, the Vikings blitz super heavy last year. It was one of the more heavy blitz teams, if not the heaviest. And then it also worked a ton this year. They still feel like they blitz heavy, but it hasn't worked as well. And I don't know if that's just second or third. This okay. year, there are other teams that blitz more. It was. Maybe it is part of Justin was terrible against the blitz, and Caleb actually has been a little bit better at reading the blitzes than Justin was. And so maybe that's why I haven't noticed as much. But the defense is scary. The Vikings defense terrifies me up front because they are they have so many guys that can get to the quarterback and create pressures. And we saw that in that game. And I, I don't Pat Jones, I guess I think technically is like behind Jonathan Grenard on the depth chart. Yeah, he's a he's a rotational player, okay. but they they've gotten him. So on third downs, they bring in all the edges. Okay. They don't have any D tackles on on like third downs. So so you'll get, you know, the the whole depth chart out there and then backups yeah. can start making plays cuz you've got, you know, an edge rusher on like a center and it's like he's yeah. not built for that. <laughs> I personally um, like I liked that move, the Jonathan Grenard move. And I remember a lot of people being like, what are they doing? They're getting ready rid of Daniel Hunter oh, for Jonathan Grenard, those, yeah. pretty much. But I obviously we talked about this before. I cover the Jack, so I was familiar with Jonathan Grenard. Mm -hmm. And I was like, when this guy's healthy, he is a monster. And he's one of those guys that can do so much, so many different things too. I also think he's pretty good against the run, which is also nice to have an edge that can do both. Um, but how have your feelings been for that? Like, are you fine with that? The, the way that trade ended up working out? Yeah, I, I missed Daniel Hunter a lot. I loved him yeah. so much. Uh, and you know, good luck to him in Houston, but I, it's, it's hard not to be thrilled with this, with what Grenard and Van Ginkle have been doing. Both of them are like leading pro bowl vote getters. Both of them yeah. looking really good for a pro bowl spot, like, and, and like playing well enough where that totally makes sense. Like that's yeah. awesome. Uh, and then they got Dallas Turner, the first round pick who's kind of buried behind all these superstars right now, but, but he's starting to show a little bit too. 
So d- that, yeah, that, that edge pass rush is really good. But what's important about those guys is that they also drop into coverage, right? Van Ginkle yeah. has two pick sixes on the year. He's the only player to have two of those this whole year. He's yeah. an edge rusher. Yeah. What? <laughs> so like <laughs> so, some, the, the whole point of the Flores defense is that they force you to play on their terms. We, you, you are going to live in your blitz answers. You do not get to do all the fun past concepts that you spent all off season dreaming up to beat this coverage and that coverage. No, you're going to be in your little side package of, of blitz answers. And you're going to have to make a whole plane out of that. Good luck. Yeah. And they, they're, they're forcing you into that chaos. And the only teams that have managed to really have consistent offensive success, like for a whole game, mm-hmm. you know, I think the bears did well in two minute when they could sort of reclaim control but the teams that have done well are the teams that didn't claim control of, you know, they said, okay, we are going to play your game, Brian yeah. Flores. We're going to pick up your blitzes. We're going to meet that head on and then continue to push the ball down the field. That's the Lions. That's the Rams. Those are the two teams that have beaten the Vikings. Yeah. That's what you really got to do. You got to, you got you to gotta be no fear. You got to say, yeah, I know like you're, you're pointing a gun at my face and you have to be like, yeah, you're not going to pull that yeah. trigger. <laughs> yeah. Like let's, let's, yeah, you got to be like the, like in the action movies when they grab it and they like push it <laughs> yeah. against their forehead. You got to be that guy. Yeah. to 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 contend with with what he does and essentially say yeah we're gonna do six seven eight in protection we're gonna do what we have to to pick up this blitz yeah. and then we're gonna make sure we can still push that ball downfield what you can't become is this like hyper conservative and you yeah. sure as heck can't become let's run around and go into chaos mode because that's when you start overthrowing things and throwing in interceptions to Byron Murphy and that's when that's when real bad stuff starts happening yeah. um you, they, they, they have to they have to keep their cool yeah I um, tweeted this week. I was like, just honestly put seven guys on the offensive line at this point because <laughs> we need to do something against <laughs> Minnesota's front. Uh, two more before I let you go. Number one, injury updates. few guys that landed on there. Uh, Stefan Gilmore, I believe, limited. Aaron Jones, limited. Pat Jones and Andrew Van Ginkle all ended up on this uh, injury report. So any of those yeah. that may not play or do they all look like they'll be playing on Sunday? I would Monday. not expect to see uh, Stefan Gilmore. He okay. sat out the last one. I wouldn't expect to see him until he starts practicing, but DNP, it, it, it was a, a walkthrough. Okay. So it was an estimation. So we'll, uh, you'll get a better one on Friday, okay. um, a better injury report on Friday. But uh, yeah, we haven't seen Stefan Gilmore all week, so probably not. You'll be dealing with Fa- Fabian Moreau instead, who's done fine, but he's a backup. So maybe a guy to target. Um, Pat Jones, he missed the game against the Falcons, the last game against the Falcons. So... I, I would say probably like a game day questionable kind of guy. Van Ginkle has been playing, but he's playing through something. So he's not playing a hundred percent. So he, he actually didn't play that great against the Falcons. Cause he was a little dinged up yeah. and he was on a pitch count. So you saw a little bit more of the rookie Dallas Turner. He yeah. played about half the game. So I, I wonder maybe they'll up it slowly again. And hopefully, you know, with time it gets a little better, but yeah, situations to watch. Yeah, you definitely want him healthy for the playoffs. Uh, yeah. So also you were mentioning Brian Flores. Now that we here in Chicago are on head coaching, next head coaching talks, he is a name that is floating around the NFL for, uh, obviously he's done it before. Can he? Will he do it again? What do you think of Brian Flores as that head coach? Do you think he's a better defensive coordinator? Than uh, he is? No, I think he'd make a really good head coach for the Bears specifically. I actually love it. I hate how much I love it for the Bears. Um <laughs> Because, like, I mean, there's this, like, idea of tradition with the Bears and stuff, but the Bears need their mean streak back, right? Like, they need to get their, you know, everybody fears us kind of thing. Everybody fears Brian Flores. The problem is owners hate this guy. Like, many owners deeply hate this guy because of the lawsuit with Miami and all that stuff. Like, it is political. Like, he thought, we thought we were losing him last year. He didn't get a call. Like, he he got, he was crickets. And so it really depends on how Kevin Warren and Jordan McCaskey and all of the the decision makers up top. And yes, Ryan Poles, I mean, I'm sure Ryan Poles doesn't care nearly as much about this. He just wants a good coach, right? <laughs> yeah. But the the people with that kind of vested interest, will George McCaskey get side eye from all his buddies at the meetings in, in February if they yeah. go out and hire Brian Flores? And I think that that dissuaded some of the teams like Carolina and uh, I'd forget whoever else had uh, head coach openings last yeah. year. But like, I think it dissuaded some of those teams because the owner came down and said, no, nah, we're not dealing with this guy. He's the, he's a snitch. He's the yeah. woke mob. He's suing over racism. We don't like that guy. Yeah. And then they take him off the list. So if the bears are willing to not do that, I think as a fit, he has learned so much since his time in Miami in terms of yeah. like how to connect with players and not be, you know, a total dick all the time. And 
like uh, Vikings defenders would go, every single one of them would go to war for that guy immediately. Yeah. You say anything ill about Brian Flores, it's on site. They'll, they'll fight you. Uh, <laughs> like they love him so much. And that's not the way that people who played with him in Miami, like if you listen to a Vikings player and a Dolphins player describe him mm -hmm. night and day. So he's, he's, he's different there. Obviously the scheme is really cool. And he learned stuff about leadership from Mike Tomlin and from Kevin O'Connell. Yeah. And like, I, I think he makes it for a much better coaching candidate than he did the first time around. Yeah. He's learned so much, but it's not a meritocracy. It's the yeah. NFL just never has been. Yeah. It's very political. And they, I mean, the bears did already, they hired Kevin Warren when things were kind of like crazy in the big 10 world with Warren and stuff. But that was also rumors of why they ended up not even interviewing Jim Harbaugh last year. So it will be interesting. Do you think any, do you think Wes Phillips get, looks at all or do you think KOC just kind of rules the world there so people aren't going to look at him I don't think he gets any credit for it I, like he does his job well he designs yeah. plays he does a little bit of uh managing stuff on the sidelines now which has actually been pretty impactful but uh no I think it's it's like Eric Bieniemy and Andy Reid where it's like oh everybody gives the head coach credit for all this <laughs> and you're just kind of part of the staff yeah. his name might help him nepotism right like his dad's pretty well-known guy that might yeah. help him someday but uh, that day ain't coming yeah. soon I don't think all right, Luke. Well, I thank you so much. Uh, Monday Night Football, Bears, Vikings. We will see which Bears show up <laughs> this week. Um, but I appreciate you hopping on with me. Yeah, of course. All right. Have a good one. Take care.